Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the director of the McEachern Institute for Public Policy and Governance here at Dalhousie University. Thanks so much for joining us for what I believe is our sixth, seventh panel in the Policy Matter Speaker Series. Uh, we start today by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. The title of today's panel is Youth Mental Health Care in Nova Scotia. What needs to change and how do we make that happen? And this panel aligns with our subject area, health systems and governance. Chairing our panel today is Dr. Jill Chorney. Dr. Chorney is a psychologist and researcher at Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Center. As faculty in behavior change and health by change institutes, Dr. Chorney's expertise is in supporting behavior change at the client, family, and healthcare provider level. She routinely conducts research that is at the intersection of evidence and practice and has been funded by the Canadian Institute for Health Research, the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, and the United States uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chorney. Thank you very much for the welcome, and welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see so many people in the room, and I understand that we have many people joining and streaming from Facebook, so this is very exciting for us. Um, as many of you will be aware, that one in five Nova Scotia youth will experience a mental illness. This comes at a tremendous emotional, physical, and financial cost to families and to our communities. Treating mental illness is complex. It cuts across our families and communities, our health systems, our education systems, justice systems, and the private sector. Complex issues rarely have simple solutions, and constructive paths forward require cooperation and open lines of communication. We often hear about gaps in mental health treatment, unmet needs, and difficult stories. These are real issues. Research shows that up to 75% of people with mental illness do not access care, and stories of unmet needs receive important media attention. At the same time, working in this system, I can honestly say that all those working in this area have the same passion and desire to improve the mental health of our children and youth, and that there's a real appetite for creative solutions and real results. Our hope today as a panel is to start a conversation. Have to be honest that we certainly don't have all the answers um, and realize that solutions only come when we have the opportunity to create them together. We have representatives from a few areas on our panels today, but we recognize that there are many voices that are needed at this table. Through our discussion today, we hope to highlight shared values that cut across all of our stakeholder groups, including those represented in the panel, in the room, on Facebook, and outside of the room today. We know that talking about mental health um, from any perspective can be emotional and raw, and we ask that we create an environment today that will set the stage for hopefully an honest, open, and curious discussion. So with that, I'll take a moment to introduce our speakers, um, and I'll give you a little bit of a structure for how we'll run the panel today. We'll start with brief introductions. We'll focus the first part of our discussion around two key questions that were prepared by our panel. Each panelist will have an opportunity to respond to each of those questions. Um, our plan is to hello, leave plenty of opportunities for uh, audience questions and participation after that, and we really welcome um, open and honest discussion. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Sharon Clark. Sharon is a psychologist in mental health and addictions and a clinical leader. Um, she has a wide range of experience working in the mental health system from inpatient um, through to outpatient settings. Our second speaker is Maureen Brennan. Maureen is the Director of Mental Health and Addictions at the IWK. She's trained as a social worker and has worked 25 years um, in the mental health system, um, both in hospital and in community settings. Uh, Maureen's role is supporting teams as well as a liaison between government and uh, the health center. I will acknowledge uh, Charmaine McPherson uh, was, uh, is from the Department of Health. Unfortunately, Charmaine came down with an illness uh, last night, so was unable to join us at the last moment. Maureen was welcomed to join us in the audience and, and is doing a fantastic job graciously stepping in for us and we appreciate that and has a really important perspective to share. I'd also then like to introduce uh, Dr. Sabina Beatty. Sabina is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and associate professor at Dal. Dr. Beatty has expertise in early psychosis and also works in a leadership uh, uh, position within the Community Mental Health and Addictions Program at the IWK. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Sue Goyette. Sue is an award-winning poet a parent, a teacher at Dal, and an advocate for creative and courageous spaces, particularly for those struggling with mental illness. 
So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our panel, and I wonder if I could start by posing our first question and get some thoughts from our group. So our first question to start the conversation today is I recognize that, that those sitting on the panel, um, mostly maybe represented at the IWK, our goal today is really to talk more broadly about um, youth mental health uh, as a, across the province and across Canada as well. So I would ask the first question from each of the panelists to speak a little bit about what mental health policy means to you in your individual role and how you see it playing out in your life. Sharon. You get to start. You get to start. Yeah, this is exciting. It's wonderful to see so many faces and so many youthful faces too, because I think that's awesome that your opinions will be part of this conversation today. Um, it's interesting to me that when we had the conversation even as a group to understand what policy meant for me was a struggle and I thought that was kind of funny because I've worked in the system for about 15 years and I didn't really know what we meant by mental health policy. So then I had to kind of back it up and sort of start to figure it out and, and initially my head kind of went to the IWK, we have policies like on hand washing and things like that but that doesn't actually pertain to what we're talking about today. <laughs> So really when I started to back it up, I thought mental health policy to me in my world really is about the quality and the kind of mental health care uh, that children, youth, and caregivers all are able to participate in when they need it. So can you get the care that you need when you need it? Do we have the right people in our system with the right skills in the right place at the right time? And that's kind of the framework for me from a policy perspective that I thought I'd think about. When I'm working with my colleagues um, as service providers, I think that often there's a tension for them on how do we balance out the prioritizing of access to care with high quality care. And from their perspective, sometimes those two things often can feel like they're at a tension point or at odds. Um, and they can also sometimes feel like the thing that we care about the most is how fast can we see people. And I think at our level in our system, we're working so hard to think about um, how can we include families, clinicians, and the whole system structure in making sure that we've got excellent care? Um, and that excellent care is, is related to access, but those two things need to be the thought of in combination. So the kind of dimensions that I think about as a clinical leader, and, and I think we're trying very hard now too to think so much about how we include the voices of families and youth in the, that construction of what the care should be, is how do we balance out quality of care um, so are we providing the right kind of care um, and do we have excellence in how we do that? How we have the morale of clinicians at the table. So how do we make sure that we're creating working environments that people want to be in, that we can keep people in, that their excellent skills stay in? Um, productivity. So are we investing our, our time and effort in our system at the right place at the right time so that we are sure that when people are coming through the door they're getting what they need at the right level of care so we're thinking about things in stepwise kind of a manner so we don't jump to one end without having thought about what needs to happen along the way. And then access to care. So we want to know that families can get that care that they're seeking for the children and youth for whom they're strong advocates for. And do we have those kinds of care, the right kind of care in the right kind of place? So can you get to it easily at a provincial level thinking about how do we make sure that people um, have access regardless of where they live? So thinking more broadly about where we position people in order to be able to have easy access. So those are my key things that I'm thinking about. Thanks, Maureen. So I would, um, and say and, um, all of what Sharon said, but certainly from an administrative lens, when I think of policy, I think it would clarify mandate around roles and scopes and services because we have many people in the space of mental health and addictions. And um, when I think of uh, the treatment that happens from a system of uh, within a system of care, I think of uh, many nonprofit organizations. I think of within uh, we have community partners within our system of care with Department of Education, Department of Justice, um, within the. Um, within our community partners across Nova Scotia Health Authority. So many people help contribute to, to, the, uh, to the care that happens. And when we look at the policy piece, um, the roles and mandates are essential because sometimes when I think of policy, I think we don't often optimize how we can work together because we have mandate confusion mm -hmm. or we have um, roles that are unclear and not known across the systems that are required to work and coordinate together. And so for me, when I think policy, I think of opportunity for us to do differently, to think differently, because within mental health and addictions, care does cut across all of those systems. And so what is our role? What is our piece in, in that partnership? 
across those different policy and mandates and how we work together, I see as a huge um, opportunity for us to work and improve and strengthen and recognizing that we're interdependent because if we're going to create a system of care that the, let's say the IWK or the hospitals might have a component, there's amazing expertise in the community that perhaps are underutilized and not brought within the system of care in a more formalized way. So looking at policy to, in a broader perspective, how can we strengthen that to work across those systems and policy to optimize care, um, both from the clinical efficiency, but then also from um, effectiveness and efficiency and, um, and working in a coordinated way. So those are some of the thoughts that I have when I think about policy. You go. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry again. Sorry again. <laughs> I'll just repeat everything they were saying. Is, is it? It's okay? Um, I think I should echo what Sharon had mentioned at the beginning when we had that conversation about what does policy mean to us. I really had to sit back and think about it um, and reflect on the fact that, in fact, we work within policy every day. So we were both seeing patients this morning. We were just speaking of this. And I sort of saw Sharon in the hallway knowing we were coming to this talk and I had to stop and think, wow, this is, we're working in, in the, under the umbrella of policy, which from a psychiatrist's point of view, and I think all of us, because we're all, you know, clinicians or users of, of the system in some way, in psychiatry, it's actually quite new. I mean, to have mental illness recognized as something that is deserving of policy development and policy formation, that's, that's something that's new in, in the last 50 years, mm -hmm. truly. Um, and having mental illness recognized as disease and truly worthy uh, of policy development is, is, is huge for us. To be able to translate that or, or at least um, include children and youth in that as well, new in the last two decades, truly. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that, mm -hmm. that we actually are part of policy development and folks are listening to our voices, which, which is new. When I, and so I think about policy as I started to think about it in different levels, sort of the idea. Sure. That's my really loud voice. <laughs> um, the, the idea that uh, mental illness is uh, fundamental to health is sort of that first, I think for me, um, piece of the umbrella or the, the layer of the umbrella. And then the second piece is what do we, what is the definition of mental illness? Mm -hmm. And how do we define what aspect of mental illness is requiring of policy development? And do we, do we base that on illness severity? Do we base that on symptoms? What are our criteria that help us define that? Um, and then underneath that, I think, is another layer of it, once we've defined that, then who, who are our targets for policy development? And then how do we implement those things? So, so I think my colleagues here have already spoken to all of the different factors and the folks who could be involved, whether it's physicians, clinicians, family, community services, community resources. Um, it's multi-layered without a doubt. And I think that is something that we certainly struggle with in, in leadership is um, my gosh, if everyone came uh, from, from the spectrum of mental illness and mental wellness um, seeking help, I mean, certainly it's a drain on resources and we need to better figure out from a policy perspective how to divide up those resources, how to ensure that folks are practicing within their scope so that we're managing those with the most severe forms of illness as well as those particularly in children and youth at risk. Mm -hmm. And that is our responsibility as a whole as well. So, so many layers to this. And I think it's exciting that we're having these conversations now because 50 years ago, we weren't even part of the, we weren't at the table, right? So from a psychiatrist's point of view, it's really quite exciting. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. So eloquent, thank you. I'm excited to be here and I'm offering a perspective that isn't quite as eloquent and a little wilder because I'm on the outside um, and I um, encounter policy as a kind of form of power in some ways because it, um, I have to comply with it to get the kind of care um, I'm advocating for. So I, I'm thinking, thinking of it in, in a slightly different way, though I appreciate it as well. And I really am excited by the creative opportunities policy and policymakers have in creating incremental changes to mental health and to any kind of social uh, support and resource. Those incremental changes to policy, I think, create the bigger changes we all are uh, wanting for everyone's sense of wellness and agency. I've been thinking about policy and the ways I've encountered it. One of the ways I encountered policy is that it's a kind of clock. 
If someone I know is experiencing a mental health issue and is in an emergency state, that clock goes very slow. The procedure is slow. The policy is slow. We often sit in waiting rooms for many hours before our people are seen. And consequently, as an advocate or as a parent or a family member or someone who's sitting with those people, our people, we feel that clock get slower and slower. So that's one way I think about it is policy is slow. And then once you're in a system of support and care, the clock moves faster and all of a sudden you're out of that care and you're back to being alone. So there's a sense of time in policy that I think about. I also think about its language. In what way and how do we name the things we need to name in order for people and their wildness to fit within the policy? That's no small thing, and I want to say that again in a different way. There's the map making, which is policy, and then the territory, which is us. And I think when those two things connect, often the territory requires a great deal of endurance, of patience, of generosity from both the caregivers and the people who are needing the care. And policy sometimes can get in the way or it can support that, that, that moment of connection. So the language in how we present what's going on, the narrative we're giving, is sometimes bullied a little by the policy. And I'm wondering how we can change the narrative so the language supports a space of agency, of healing, of generosity and patience for the people who are needing it. That's something I think about a lot. Um, another thing I think about um, is that territory. Um, you know, it's kind of like when you open your door in this season and all the leaves come in. You know, you go into a place that is um, set up to care and support and we're the leaves blowing in. There's a, wild, a wildness to us. Territory isn't quite the, you know, wi winemakers have the word terroir, which, and the grapes kind of absorb their climate and, 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 it, and it affects how they taste. And I think we have a terroir to us and no wonder one in five when you think of the state the planet is in. And I don't think that state and the heaviness we feel is going to get any better. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. I hardly know anything, but I'm really excited to participate. I think you know a lot more than laughing. you're saying you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what I recognize here as I, as I hear the first responses to the panel is really at how many different levels we're thinking about this issue. And I think oftentimes in conversations we tend to try to distill things down to the simplest level or distill things down to the easiest answer. And I think the complexity of mental health and the complexity of mental illness really calls for some of these conversations that we hear at this point. So I'll ask my second question to the panel, which I think you may end up picking up on some of the things that you've already talked about. But what do you see as the most important issues to be tackled in youth mental health right now? And what would be your ideal future state? Not a hard question at all, right? <laughs> it's an easy one. Sharon, why don't we start with you again? Um, so one of the things that I am pretty passionate about is that I'm really interested in how we start to create a different story about what engagement is. And what I mean by that is um, sort of how as a system of care do we engage differently with families and with youth? How is the voice heard in a different kind of way? And also how do we kind of rethink who the we is in mental health care? So often there's like an us and them kind of language that can develop. And I'm picking up on what Sue's saying around that excitement that can come from going into unknown territories. I feel like I'm really interested in how we sort of create an environment of genuine engagement um, with youth, with caregivers, with clinicians, um, that we all can sort of understand the roles that we, we play in the process of treatment, but also across that continuum of care, because I also pick up on what Maureen is saying as mental health care crosses an entire continuum and how we pull people into that process. Um, and appreciate their strengths at each of those levels becomes really important. So I really want to rethink how we think about we. What is it to, between clinician, family, and that partnership that develops? Um, and part of engagement in my mind also is kind of demystifying what happens in the office. So a lot of the time families, for very good reasons, want to see psychiatry. They think the direct line to psychiatry, which it makes a lot of sense because Sabina is awesome, but at the same time, there's so many steps that can happen in between. And I think as strong advocates, um, sometimes it's really hard for us uh, 
to back up that train and understand at a clinician level greater transparency on what does solid, strong, healthy mental health mean for a family, and then be able to work with them to really understand the different pieces, what's going well, what's not going so well, and really think about what they're able to do at this point. Because so much of mental health care is based on behavior change, we really do have to have a different conversation related to engagement because I think of a lot of the times families might be set up to not really understand what is required for care, what kind of action is going to be required. Um, and I think we have to have those conversations way earlier to break down that public perception sometimes of coming in and lying on a sofa. I mean, that isn't what we do in modern mental health care and we really need to think differently about how people are prepared for that. Um, so I think a challenge for us at a system level, working with the public, and I don't know how policy fits into this, but how do we start to have earlier policy conversations around what engagement looks like and what real partnerships look like and what does real behavior change require? And then my third piece related to engagement was, is that I think we also have to really move from kind of what I'm going to call one-dimensional thinking. So sometimes people present with very complex situations, and when we only look at it with a mental health lens, we aren't seeing the full scope either. So we really need to shift into sort of three-dimensional, even like augmented reality kind of state of how do we pull in all of the partnerships of education and justice and Department of Community Service, and how do we let the family sort of drive that process of complexity to be able to pull in the parts and as a system respond to what they need because if we only look at it from a mental health lens we're missing out on all the contextual factors that are so hugely important in informing about what actually treatment or a course of treatment or a continuum of treatment needs to look like so I'd really love us to be thinking bigger um, around how we partner differently to think um, about really complex problems in, in very bold and innovative kind of ways. Thank you. I want to pick up on something Sharon said about um, <clears throat> the increasing complexity of the uh, children, uh, youth and adults coming through the door today. Um, it is different today than it was five years, ten years and twenty years ago. And I think Sharon's point is well made about the, the not only the um, comorbid or the one doesn't come in with just anxiety, it's typically an anxiety with substance misuse or anxiety with psychosis and so there's multiple things happening at the same time and system challenges and barriers that end up impacting exacerbating that presentation through the door so the complexity of those particular presentations that um, are sort of deemed within the mental health spectrum it is it is challenging and, and it is um, certainly a way that we have to be more innovative and, and creative and and develop partnerships to respond to so I think your point is very well made uh, I couldn't sit here and not identify access. Um, access to care is essential. Um, no weight is, is, is good enough. And, and so we're, uh, as a system, how we need to think differently, what we need to do differently. We have to have different conversations. We have to look at access in innovative ways. So what is the virtual e-mental health options? Um, community partnerships, extremely important. How we develop genuine community partnerships to leverage the support, ease the flow of our system so that we're not restricted by policy. I have a policy friend who always reminds me, well, policy is only for 80% of the time. So I, I often will, will think about that and think, yes, because policy is not perfect. And we have to look out and continuously ask questions. What is it we have to do that we might be creating unintended barriers to shift that policy, to update it, to recognize what needs to be different, because today is different. Our populations are different, and we are all different. And so as, as a system, as we're supporting, we have to continuously ask and remind ourselves, what is it that we need to do differently to respond to who's coming through the door? And uh, the other piece that I would say that is a, is a concern to what I think about is, so it's who's showing up at the door, but more worrisome is who's not showing up at the door. And I worry about those invisible populations that aren't necessarily coming up for a variety of reasons um, that we're not doing right by those populations, so we need to do something different. So who is it that's not coming through the door that we need to reach out and start engaging those communities, those, those populations, to do it differently? So I think that's a, that's a concern. And a final concern would be a, a what I'm noticing when I'm listening to clinicians and families, and I hear a, a growing rate of uh, concern around children of parents with untreated mental illness and the challenge that the system and, and how to respond and, and to support and, 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 and respond to that situation. And so working within a child and adolescent system, our policy would say our mandate is we work with the youth. 
And of course, we would say we do family-centered, patient-centered care, so we treat the family system as it relates to the youth. But we don't have a mandate and we don't have a policy that would allow us to respond to the untreated parent who perhaps doesn't have the skills, ability, knowledge, or resources to advocate for supports herself. So our system, how do we create a new policy to talk to systems in the adult? So th that's an opportunity for us to kind of address that, because if we're truly an integrated system, we should have that family system coming in and respond to it. So those are the, some, some of the things that um, I worry about, I, I think about, and I think we need to address. I've forgotten the question. No, I have no biggest challenge. No, biggest challenge. And, and ideal, and, I think. And ideal. And, and, and ideal. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> we love talking to you. The ideal? Us. I'm like, oh, what is that? I, I, um, I think just to start, just to reflect on what you were saying, I think both of you there, um, in terms of complexity, and I sort of wrote it down. And what I wanted, the first thing that hit my mind when you said that was, while we certainly, without a doubt, have increasing complexity within our youth um, in terms of their presentation and the families from which they, you know, are, they come and are reared, increasing complexity does not always lend itself to increased severity of illness or illness itself. And, and I just wanted to speak to that. So, because oftentimes, back to what you were saying, that is the assumption. And we often, we, we will speak about, um, misperceptions on behalf of us, uh, you know, our world, clinicians, those who provide care, as well as society who consume the care, misperceptions uh, around what is illness and, and what is stress or, or distress. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think about ideal um, or my hopes, it would be that we open up the we to include all of us working together, all, again, I think we've, we're, I'm repeating what folks are saying, but from schools to community resources to phys family physicians, other levels of primary care, and then sort of that higher you know, tertiary library care, open up the doors so we communicate better to address all the spectrum of presentation. Because the majority of children and youth are well. And I think we work within a very skewed population. And the majority are well. The majority navigate their trajectory of development in adolescence without too much difficulty. We tend to see those who are who, where the distress has crossed that you know, fence into illness. Um, and what what I'd love is for all of us to be able to build our capacity to focus on wellness. Because if we don't focus on wellness, we will become ill. Um, and, and that piece around uh, early intervention, risk prevention, indicated prevention is something, again, new language in the last 10 years, and I think we don't focus on it enough when we're thinking about policy because we focus so much on disease mm -hmm. um, and forget that disease is a spectrum. We do it better in, in other areas of medical health. When we think about cancer and some, you know, somebody presents with a lump, we don't automatically think mastectomy, right? We think about screening, we think about uh, um, identification in primary care offices. We think about, okay, if you're at a school, we're going to teach you in, in a, at a tier one level, like primary prevention level, about how to uh, do a, an appropriate breast exam. We need to do better in this way uh, around mental health because if we keep focusing on illness severity and the most severe, we are missing, as you mentioned, the, the, the greater prevalence of varying degrees uh, of illness and wellness. So that's our hope, that's what we're working towards, is sort of opening the lines of communication, I think, so that folks will feel more capable to be able to do that. So if a youth in a school comes to their nurse and says, I feel stressed, the automatic isn't, let's refer you to psychiatry. Not because we don't want to see those kids, but because there are people who have better scope of practice to manage that kind of presentation, right? I'm not going to initiate a medication for stress. We don't do that, and in fact, that would be extremely harmful. So I think, uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there. That's that's all of our goals. So, um, there's such good collective wisdom in the room right now. Um, I'm thinking of back to language and how mental health is often pathologized in a way that can feel quite hopeless. And so, I think one of the challenges I think about a lot is the stigma and its offspring of shame that happens uh, when someone experiences a mental health um, dilemma. 
and how that language of pathology kind of fertilizes that feeling. And when I go to anything that challenges me, I know that I'm also in the vicinity of its solution or resolution. And so I'm thinking, here we have uh, people who have lived experience, who know the system and the policy, the policy being a construct, the people being the people, who know what it's like, and I'm thinking peer um, company, peer support for younger people would be crucial and almost would undo that idea of stigma because there would be a worthiness to that, that experience. It would be esteemed. It would be redignified in a way that is so healing. The, the conversation also about community, I think we are interconnective. And so someone's journey into their own agency, knowing what they need, um, does involve family and community. There's a source of echolocation with people you live with. So the lying on the couch, when someone mentioned lying on the couch, meaning you know therapy, I thought of like a t my teenage son lying on the couch, and I'm like, go to school. So <laughs> to both lying on the couch, how it can move on both sides of the uh, uh, idea of policy. I'm thinking um, that terroir that I talked about also clinicians bring that to their practice as well and that's no small thing this is a this is a um, this calling this service is hard on people's psyches and I'd like to and I think radical self-care needs to be implement, implemented in our for our the people who are in the trenches I think we're seriously you know and I and I, I support it's true there's a spectrum and there's there are people who are managing quite well, and then there are people who are having some trouble. But it is a difficult time on the planet. There's a lot of smog and pesticide, and things are dying. It's hard. And I want to recognize that self-care is a radical thing because we've been programmed by another construct called gender to like not, not, not working kind of devalues our sense of worth. So like slowing down and taking the time we need to recalibrate and remember who and how and why we are doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes in this kind of time that we're on, which is heavily scheduled and rushed. So a lot of, I think, what, what I encounter is um, the time we're on the planet. I teach at Dal. I know a lot of my students uh, feel anxiety in a way that I don't remember feeling, and we talk about that a lot. I teach in a creative writing program, so that is a worthy chimney for that smog to get out. So a, a creative practice, I think, early, so that an emotional articulation happens. That's also important, because the first response to any kind of dilemma is a kind of closing off, and you kind of want people to connect. Thanks, Sue. So what I hear in themes as we call, as, as I listen to our really thoughtful um, comments, is really this whole idea of we, we often think about mental illness as this one thing out here that's separate from everything else. And it's like a pathology that lives on its own. And I think what we're hearing right now is it's not this one thing out here. In some ways, it's on a continuum with our lives that, that come in a community, that come in a system, that come across all of that. And that becomes a challenge sometimes when we're living in the worlds of mandates and scopes and how, in some ways, we have to parse things apart to figure out where do we offer what and how. And I think that's we're constantly in this place of figuring out how do we look at creative ways to parse apart this really messy thing that is life that, that in some ways comes with um, all of these other pieces as well. So I want to thank you, the, the panel, for the first part of this. This summarizes our two questions that we've prepared, and we have left plenty of time for student questions. I'm looking at your face. Are we okay with that? Um, so I have a list of students um, who have volunteered to ask questions. I can call you out if you'd like. Chantal is the first person I have. Hello. Of course you're in the front. Yes. <laughs> You're all in the front. Oh, I can just go down the line? Even better. Perfect. That's even better. I'm going to ask you guys to use your outside voices as much as possible. If needed, I can, I can review. And I'm going to remind the panels to use your outside voices as much as possible, too. So hello. I'm Chantelle. I'm in the MPA program here at Dell. And my question is for Sabina. And my question relates to access to care and wait times. 
So during the time that patients are waiting to receive care, are there any tools or supports provided to prevent non-urgent cases from worsening? And if so, what do these include? And if not, are there any other types of preventative measures in place? Do I need the microphone? Outside or voice. Outside my, <laughs> <laughs> my outside voice, my inside voice. That's a great question, actually. Um, so definitely, yes. So for folks waiting, and I can speak to sort of here within HRM, and I think it lends itself to, to <coughs> services provincially as well. But for folks waiting um, for their, their first appointment or, or, you know, coming to attention, there are services for children and youth, for example, in schools. So in, in schools we have teen health centers, definitely, so there's a public health nurse um, who they can access, but also an, an increasing capacity for school mental health clinicians. Um, so kids over the years, when we finally learn that we actually need to ask them what they want, to be honest, have said, please come and meet us where we're at. Right, and, and so while not every child and, or, or adolescent wants to be seen at school, it is something that they've, they've wanted to advocate for. So that is, that is new, to, to be honest, over the last, again, last five to ten years. But so children who, are, who may or may not be on the wait list either way can access school mental health. And so services, providing services for them depending on the, the, the difficulties with which they present. Um, certainly, but also from a primary care perspective in the community, there are now um, resources um, in the community. So whether it's Dartmouth, Sackville, or Halifax, uh, through Halifax Rec, through community partnerships, through primary care, who also have liaisons with us uh, within mental health uh, at the RWK and other services. Um, there are, for example, uh, wellness um, education classes, classes around hygiene, sleep hygiene. There are um, accesses to resources around um, mental health and what it means to have signs or symptoms of, for example, depression or anxiety or that type of thing. So these are, the, and for, at least through the IWK and I'm sure through other avenues, um, these are resources that we can navigate for children and youth if they just called, um, that type of thing. And certainly, of course, there's always primary care in terms of family physicians. That's that's been a stress without a doubt in this province, but th for those who are lucky enough to have a family physician currently, that is somebody they can access as well. And that's not just for the children and youth, it's also for their families. Does that answer your, yeah, your question? Should we just go down the line? Yeah. You next? Go for it. <laughs> How are you guys doing at the me. back for hearing? Okay. Off and off, down. Oh, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a first year MPA student here at Dow as well. Um, my question was originally for Charmaine, who couldn't join us, but I feel, Maureen, you'd be equally equipped to answer it with your history and social work. Okay. Um, so it's regarding the shared decision making model for treatment. Uh, it seems to be a, both a positive and progressive shift towards asserting control into the individual seeking treatment back into their life to help make decisions. I'm wondering if this form of treatment is available in the forensic mental health system. And if so, is it seen as a progressive shift the same way it is um, outside of the forensic system? And if not, does it have a place within the forensic mental health system? That's a great question. Did you hear the question at the back? Uh, it's a great question, and <clears throat> it builds upon the tenets of our capital mod model of care, which is a choice and partnership model that um, where a family youth person comes to the appointment um, with their own goals, with their own ideas of what they want to work on, their own particular um, wishes for treatment, and so it starts there. It's the idea of collaborating um, with that. So the short answer is yes. That does happen. Do we need to do more of it within the forensic system? Absolutely. But as we roll across our community clinics with the CAPA model and bring in the forensic services, who are the ambulatory, we have ambulatory services for them as well, that um, absolutely, that when um, treatment happens, it is really about that person coming into the space, into the room, identifying what they want to work on. It is a Treatment is voluntary. It's not involuntary, and we can't mandate anyone. And it, Sharon talks a lot about engagement. 
<clears throat> oftentimes it's how we engage and that we start where the, where the person brings their goals to the table. What is it they want to work? And we start there and we build on that conversation and can we uh, uh, course correct and change based on the uh, wishes of that particular client? Absolutely, because that would be patient client centered care. And um, within the forensic services that model is, is working and it's happening. Can we strengthen that and, and embrace that? Absolutely, and work on that for sure. Trevor Vandertoon, my question is for Sabina. Um, I wanted to ask, do you feel that we're building essential societal institutions that people have to interact with every day, such as schools, um, you know, government institutions and employers around um, mental health norms that are restrictive and drive people with mental illness and mental difference to crisis? And how do you feel that we can change attitudes, uh, you know, from bosses to teachers to, uh, you know, the people we interact with at Service Canada uh, to make things easier for people with mental illness? Hmm. Glad you got that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> Don't be we'll sorry. <laughs> I want to make sure that I fully understand. Do I feel that the norms within these institutions are uh, have an influence on whether or not folks access help or pot potentially become more ill? Is that yeah? Are, are are things built around essentially a standard of what is normal? Uh, so when someone is yeah. non-normal, it creates problems for them. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, How we flex. I think we're changing um, in this area. So I think historically, and of course this is my own personal opinion, I, I'd, I'd value others' thoughts on this. I think historically we erred on the side of norm. You know, <coughs> normal being whatever, and truly I often say this to the kids too, I, I'm not really sure what that means. I try not to use that word typical or atypical. Mm -hmm. um, not that it's a bad word, it's just hard to really define. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, and I believe that you spoke to this a little bit as well, Sue, that, that, yeah, that, <laughs> that we live, oh gosh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's certainly changing in that I think the, we're opening up our language around mental illness. We're trying to break down the barriers, um, specifically around stigma, in that we're talking more about it. There's certainly a ways to go. Now, I want to be careful about this comment. I worry a little bit that as we open up our conversation and use <coughs> language that helps to be more th th inclusive in terms of what's mental illness, that sometimes we ha the pendulum has swung a little bit too far. So while we're, we're talking and I don't want to negate it, but we're talking more about mental illness and um, and needing to take time and needing to take care and needing to access help. I think I'm hoping that we will balance that out over time, and I've already spoken to this, about what's mental wellness. What is stress? What is distress? Mm -hmm. Because I, I worry in our kids particularly where there's so much influence from the media, from other sources, um, from their peers, that that there is an, it, we're creating a bit more of a misunderstanding and and, we, and in turn influencing our youth's resilience mm -hmm. to cope does that so i've kind of digressed a little bit from your question but i could talk about this forever but um uh, i think historically absolutely folks were very reticent to speak about their difficulties with mental health I had a conversation earlier this week with a youth um, where I was really trying to you know, help him get to a place where he may be uh, agreeable to considering a treatment for the illness with which he presented. And it was really hard for him because very, and this is just this week, right? Uh, he said, well, then that would make me weak, mm. you know, if I considered this medicine. So there's a lot of work that we mm. need to do in this area, mm -hmm. but at least we're having the conversation and we're at a place where this youth is actually coming for help, mm. at least this particular one, not that everybody does. So lots of work to do on both sides of the pendulum. Mm. Can I add something? I've made, yeah, it, I've made it more complicated. Yeah. I would normally move on to the next student question, but yes. I, I see it's a Sue great question. Gonna, like, burst over there. being okay. ready to comment. So I feel like I need to give Sue a comment, and then we'll move on to Thank questions. I'll, I'll be brief. I just think, <laughs> I just think 
what we're seeing, this is my, pers my perspective, and I'm always wrong and probably hugely Holst. impractical. No, but I say that with great spirit. I'm happy with it. But I think <laughs> we're living in a neoliberal time, and it's all about capital. And so normal fits into capital. And we're seeing systems break. The Me Too movement, our mental health, people are, can't keep mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is neoliberalism is meeting humanity, and it's smoking. So what do we do? You know, here you are in the privileged position of changing the huge container ship's direction towards humanity and care, rather than away from the bank, away from, because the trouble with policy that I have, and Foucault, if you want to read about all this, is that there's no one in charge. It's just, you know, you have these good people who are helping, you have people who need help, and there's a policy that sometimes, like, Hmm. creates pathology, mm -hmm. creates um, not enough beds. We only have a bed for you for a week and then we're gonna have to put you across the harbor where your family is not because there's no bed. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's based on schedule and business and we have good people on the ground but the policy is blowing off capital. It's all about money. And so what has to shift is us taking back our power because it's power down. It's a construct. We have to take back our power so it's a interconnected dialogue rather than a we're obeying dialogue. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> I think it's okay that we have a comment on that one for sure. Thank you, Sue. Awesome. I'm Dana. I'm from the Masters of Resource and Environmental Management program at Dell. And my question is, you've kind of all touched on it, but it's for Sue right now. And it's sort of dealing with adolescents being a really challenging time for youth. They tend to be more secretive from their parents and sort of like distant as they're changing substantially and sort of how do we bring parents into the fold of dealing with ad adolescent mental health when teens don't really want that yeah. and like what's the role of clinicians and doctors in that you know in my experience as a parent and my nephew was just visiting and he was 17 and right in the middle of that woof, fork you kind of attitude um, I'm understanding more as I get older. And I think what I've realized, because I had great, I have a great relationship, I had a great relationship with my kids when they were in their adolescence, was that what they were resisting was my authority. And when I gave them space to be who they were, buy them an ice cap and let them talk, mm -hmm. we had really amazing conversations. Because they have the genius of their own morphology and physiology. They know what they need. You know, the form and content and how they grow. It's like bot botanical. They know how to flower. And we just have to give them the space mm. so that they can continue becoming who they are. Mm. And we can also support how they become who they are by offering perhaps a little resistance. Like, meh, you know you are smoking a lot of grass. <laughs> I don't know if staying up till four when you have like exam, you know, that kind of talk, which is going to be resisted and I expect that, but I'm not going to stop it because that, that, that is an authoritative, that's care. Mm -hmm. But we're coming from generations of I know better than you and we're recovering from that. And so that's how I was parented. I was parented from the top down. I know, don't do what I say. You know, don't do what I do, do what I say. I'm the boss of you, which I resisted, which probably put me into the target of mental health because I smoked my brains out and partied. You know, like, you know, that was my resistance. So I'm just thinking if we learn to you know, give each person the space to be the genius of themselves, people are happy when they're themselves. And that happiness, that vitality is contagious. And that vitality is the opposite of a mental health dilemma. It's, and it, and it, it, it connects, and it has agency. And it's not being shoved into a form. It's being given the space to, I really like the approach of, that hasn't been my experience, but I love the approach of someone saying, this is what I need. That has not been my experience. I, 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 that to me is a dream mm -hmm. for someone to be asked what they need and, ha and how, you know, instead of switching medications because this doesn't seem right, when we know mental health is episodic in some cases mm -hmm. and we just have to ride that storm because the medicine worked for those seven years, you know what I mean? And, and switching medication, we're back to territory and terroir and medica switching medication is MAP. Mm -hmm. And the fallout to medica you know, switching medications and the side effects and the intermingling of medications is a huge impact on, on the person and the family and the ability to work. But that's far from your question. I just think, like, let them just be them. 
and not worry like, you know, I want to be a poet, not a lawyer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to add too, if I may. Um, so kind of, I have a parent role and a clinician role, and the clinician role is the one that's going to speak right now. But the one that I, I, I have the opportunity to meet with a lot of families for their first appointment. And what I'm often struck by is that parents need permission to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that I sometimes worry that as a culture, we're starting to think that teens don't want their parents to be involved. And in fact, clinically, that's not been my experience. Same. That they're desperate to be seen, mm -hmm. that they want to be heard, mm -hmm. they want to be understood. Um, and that even when their parent isn't well enough to do the job, they still want that parent to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would love for us to start to think much more expandedly around how do we include all yes, of those absolutely. parts because absolutely. in order for mental health treatment to be successful, and I say successful in terms of functioning better and having a life that means something of value for them, mm -hmm. they have to be supported in a different way and it expects way too much for an adolescent to be able to go out and do that and make all those changes mm -hmm. happen. And I often use the metaphor of a canoe, you know, if someone's going to stand up and make some change, the other one's got to shift too to accommodate or everyone's going to fall out. Yes. So, yeah. so much of our treatment requires disruption to current patterns and we have to have parents be actively involved. And I really want to pull and create space mm -hmm. so that it's okay for a teenager to say, actually, my parents are like not super cool, but they're good <laughs> enough. Mm -hmm. And I really want them to be part of this. So how do we give permission for those kinds of conversations so that we don't continue to thicken the story on teens don't want to have anything to do with their parents? Because I, I actually, I don't believe that that's true. And I don't think it's healthy for us to think about that as society. I think we really have to come together differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's all good. I agree. That's the end of student questions? No, one more. One more. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Cassandra. I'm also a first year MPA student. Um, my question is for Sharon. Um, so we know that people are waiting a very long time to get care, um, especially those who need care right away, urgent. Um, what do you think can be done to combat this, especially in the case of somebody needing urgent care? Mm. So I like to think about a continuum of services so much. So, and often people go through different phases where things feel very acute and sometimes they're chronic situations too. So I, I guess what I'm thinking a lot about is how do we have the early conversation about what is the presenting problem so that we can do a better job of matching people to what they need. When that matching happens in a way that their voices are really heard and it makes sense to them at that point, it actually creates so much more space eventually for those that actually need that very acute pull in in a very timely kind of manner because of the level of symptom problems that they have at that point. So I think we can't just focus on the most acute getting fast without thinking about the whole piece of the puzzle because all of those parts are complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. And if we can think around how we kind of layer in those services as people need different things or different levels of intensity, then I think that um, earlier presenting, we get to see them sooner, we get to see them faster, is, is really as important, differently, as being able to meet the most acute at that point in time too. So I like to see us offer more so that we can shift back and see people earlier so that we have fewer needing to get to that point. I'm gonna reach right across. Yes. But that, that I do think we can't just focus on one spectrum or we miss the entire continuum and then we miss out on the opportunities to really provide care in a different kind of way. And I would take it up a notch and say, and what is that we're doing in the upstream in the health promotion prevention and policy plays a big piece mm -hmm. with uh, uh, health promotion and mm -hmm. population health. So I think that's a key as we look at a system and transforming a system of care. We have to look at all components, the broader spectrum, policy on a health promotion, health wellness, but then also what are our, what are our investments in our community uh, touchstones to make sure access happens on all levels. So not just within our our sort of piece of the puzzle, but how are we creating more innovative ways and engagement for different levels of care to be accessed? And I think those are some opportunities for us to, to continue to grow in as well. So we have a few questions coming in from online first. So we're going to grab a couple of those and then we'll come to the room. Uh, so the first question is from Alyssa. Um, and it says, are there specific emergency services that youth can access if they are in distress, uh, perhaps not able to leave home? Additionally, in terms of primary care, what are some of the preventative measures providers are taking to support youth? And I, I don't think that was directed. Okay. So I'll ask the panel if one 
person. So I hear two questions in yeah. that. One is I hear about um, potentially mobile crisis, or I hear about um, emergency services for kids mm -hmm. who might not be able to access emergency services. And then the other one is primary care. So I might break those up potentially and ask someone to comment first on the emergency services. I, I can certainly talk about some um, right. some of the can services. Can you guys hear okay at the back? Wave if you can't, okay? Can't hear? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'll repeat if you so of course we have the emergency department, there's mobile crisis, we have an urgent care clinic that has a mandate to, to follow up within, a, within, seven, within seven days. Uh, we also have a follow, -up a follow up next day service, so depending on a, a person that might be coming into the emergency department, um, there's an ability for us to have a service layered onto them to have more uh, speed of access depending on those particular <laughs> needs. Uh, we've also been piloting, because I think what I heard is, what about someone that is unable to come in and that might be in a crisis at home? So we've been piloting uh, different innovative ways to engage with them through um, Medio virtual um, software platform that meets the sort of the health uh, information privacy standards. And what we've been doing is trying to access, um, uh, identify those people that can't come in that might require um, a virtual uh, assessment, follow-up intervention, and so we've been piloting that software to see if there might be a fit to meet those needs. Um, so that would provide the ability for a, I'll focus on a youth who might have a iPhone or an iPad to actually have direct Skype access to a clinic, clinician, um, psychiatrist, uh, physician, um, psychologist to do a particular assessment and provide direct treatment and support around the plan of care. So there's different ways that we're trying to explore and um, and provide some depth to what we're offering. So those are some of the things. And I heard primary. And the second part was about primary, 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 primary care. care. I mean, yeah. I can, um, that's something that we value without a doubt, at least within our program. So some of the opportunities or resources that we have um, are ha collaborating with primary care. So fa family physicians, for example. So there are some youth, although not many, who visit their family physician. But there are some who would prefer to do that as opposed to come, come into the, to, to see uh, mental health, whether it's at the IWK or otherwise. So again, open line of communication, whether it's telephone consult, face-to-face -face consult, any means by which we can collaborate with family practice, um, as well as school mental health and school, um, well, it's called Schools Plus, but teen, teen health centers, I mean, certainly we're open to that, and that does happen on a regular basis. So. Um, Again, going back to what I said before, if we can meet these youth where they're at um, to foster help seeking, we want to be able to do that. And so that, that starts with finding out what they want, mm -hmm. right? And, and what, they, what they would need um, and what their goals are in terms of trying to, to achieve better health outcomes. I would also add on to that the importance of um, partnerships with primary health um, providers and in our community providers. So partnering up to provide a shared care model. So we're branching out to provide uh, a focus on pr providing ease of access and to establish partnerships with communities, um, the organizations that might be supporting high-risk youth, but then also uh, with a dual focus for that clinician that might spend a day a week in that particular organization, focusing on ease of access, but also the capacity building of those that are supporting those high-risk youth. How do we build up those skills and comfort and capacity to respond to those kids differently? So that's also a model that we're trying to expand and, um, and provide that more immediate access. One more, and then we'll go to the room. Yeah. You had your hand up earlier. Okay. Uh, so my question is. Uh, Hi. Um, my question is for Dr. Abidi, um, and it has to do with um, actual things that the municipal or the provincial government can do uh, in order to prevent mental health in youth. Um, are there certain policies? Um, around the built environment or the way um, resources are allocated in the community? Are there, is there anything based on your um, experience that can prevent the development of mental health challenges? That's a great question. I, and I don't have a specific, it's not, you know, not that I'm able to sort of say if they did this, definitely this very specific thing. But I think if, and it's not an if because we are doing some of a lot of this already but helping those who are at the front line again i go back to school family right mm -hmm. helping at, they are the, the biggest front line the strongest front line i think and I, again echoing what sharon was saying 
and probably the most important. So building their capacity to be open um, to having the conversation about mental wellness and mental illness, I think is key, really, to prevention, without a doubt. I mean, when we talk about uh, <coughs> psychiatric illnesses, so my, my, my work is very much around kids with schizophrenia or psychotic disorders. Just because you have a family history or a genetic history, you know, loading um, for development of an illness like that, like schizophrenia, in no way does it determine that you will definitely develop that illness. There is a huge component of environmental risk and environmental trigger that will determine whether or not the genetic risk is manifested. And so helping children and youth certainly be aware of that, be able to have the conversation with them around that, which means that the parents themselves and primary care and teachers and schools have to be okay with that as well. That is essential in helping to reduce risk. Sometimes we don't have control over well, whether illness develops, but in many ways we do. And that is a luxurious place to be in, really. To, to know that maybe there's risk, but if I just, you know, had more open conversation, if I talked better, uh, better, talked more about marijuana and the risk associated with that in a reasonable way, if the media could be a bit more responsible about that. So, you know, helping to open up that, those lines of communication, I think that would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Because we can't recognize something until somebody starts to talk about it. is just not listening mm -hmm. and then to be sent to the psychiatrist mm -hmm. who can diagnose and give medication mm -hmm. um, and then them saying why are you seeing me <laughs> well I'm, I'm trying to see you because nobody else will listen mm -hmm. so I'm not sure how like the doctors really need to step it up 100%. and I realize yeah. that they're on the front lines yeah. like what is it one in four doctors actually contemplate suicide themselves like, it's not just for the youth, it's for everybody. It, absolutely right. It, it's building capacity on all levels because again, uh, you know, so I spoke about family and schools, but you're absolutely right in terms of family practice. And they, in many ways, will ask for that help, mm -hmm. that education. You know, oftentimes they approach us and say, we're just so not sure. And it so it's, that goes doctors, back to education. So the doctors in the hospitals do have mental health training. Like, it's not, they don't actually have to mental health, I mean, um, so is the question, I, I wonder in terms of question around what education practices for family docs in, when it comes to mental health training. So inherent in just medical school training, there is training around mental health, around, you know, psychiatric illness, around neurological disorders, that type of thing. Um, and, and then when they go on to their residency, we in psychiatry go out and teach as well. Could there be more? Always. Right. Well, I, I will certainly advocate that to the end. Could there be more training around mental health and psychiatry? I, that's what I can speak to. I'm sure your urologist might come around and say we need more training in that area well, as well. I'm trying to find yeah. Your doctor, like I'm going to my general practitioner, which is kind of like an overall doctor, am I right? Mm -hmm. But for her to sit there and tell my child, oh, you look all right. Mm -hmm. And I think what what we're what yeah. we're sort of seeing in all of this, and I think what the panel is talking about, is really having this opportunity to have these kinds of conversations, to be able to open the lines of, of communication between mm -hmm. public and patients and, and some of the groups that we work with, I think is really, really important. So I appreciate your comment. Yeah, I see you with a hand up in the back there. <coughs> Had it up the whole time, so I wanted to make sure. Okay. He's got a piece of paper, so it's very efficient. Hi. <laughs> I think it's Sue, right? My question is for Sue. Uh, you, mess you mentioned uh, neoliberalism and uh, capital and policy making. And obviously in healthcare, that's extremely important, especially in Nova Scotia, where uh, healthcare spending, I think, makes up 45% of our GDP expenditure in Nova Scotia in 2018. So that's a large chunk. And obviously a very important role in, role in policy making in healthcare is, is considering money and economics. Um, so, and I, and I think that you had, a, you had a problem with maybe there's not enough uh, autonomy in decision making because of the role of money. And, um, and I'm, I'm wondering, are you asking for a paradigm shift? And then I think, 
On top of that, if you are asking for a paradigm, shi paradigm shift, wouldn't it be easier to align the goals of healthcare with the neoliberal current paradigm? And a way to do that could be to make the argument that too much regulation in healthcare currently reduces autonomy for doctors and their ability to treat patients, but it also uh, creates wasteful spend spending, right? So you're aligning your goals of the healthcare initiative to I increase autonomy for doctors and increase autonomy for healthcare providers with the neoliberal goals of reducing wasteful expenditure in healthcare. Would that be a suggested a, a potential platform to go forward? Thank you. So essentially, you're asking me is like, should we align with ne a neoliberal? Yeah, that's a big question. Before I answer, <laughs> <laughs> before I like that, I'm thank. I just want to acknowledge how painful and lonely it is when you have a child who needs help and you're sitting in an office mm -hmm. and you know and you don't have the vocabulary to ask for it and you know that there's something elementally wrong. I just want to acknowledge how painful and lonely that is and that it's it's a it's warrior work and I see you. It's um, you know, neoliberal one percent of all the rich people and ninety percent ninety nine percent of us, no. No, I don't think neoliberal is a good thing. Shift. Yeah, paradigm shift incrementally. Policy makers is where the power is. Just one change in the verb. A whole, a, a different, you know how like a flock of birds change with just one bird changing direction? One verb change. Neoliberal, never, no. Because it individualizes us and it forget, there's no community in, mm -hmm. in the idea of neoliberal. And all we're hearing is we need community. Mm -hmm. There's only one space in the city where you can sit and not spend money and sit in community intergenerationally, and that's the library. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to a mall, you're going to a coffee shop, and you only have a coffee, you know, like a cigarette or a cup of coffee length of time to stay there. So I'm, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Parents or, or which is in your hands. You know, this is why it's exciting to talk to you. You are the next step. So what language? I dare you, change it, shake it up, disrupt the power. Here's how it happens. Yeah. Meet you on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so, so powerful, I really appreciate it. Yeah, the back. Uh, the black shirt right there. <laughs> Stand up. You know who I'm looking at. Um, all right, so my question is directed primarily to Sharon and Maureen, um, mostly because I have a background in social work and addictions, but now I'm doing my MPA, so I feel like this lines it up together. Um, where do you see the most complex barriers to accessing care systems for youth? And in that, in that, what I really want to draw on is what policies are creating barriers instead of pathways that you personally see as frontliners every day because youth don't access things. And lots of youth don't, I shouldn't say don't have parents, don't associate with their parents, don't go to school. Mm -hmm. um, we have youth falling through the cracks constantly. Yeah. I've worked in departments where like, I mean, in shelters mm -hmm. and in group homes where these kids otherwise mm -hmm. don't have access to anything. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, what do you see as policy flaws that are detrimental to youth health care? Great question. Okay. Well, we'll tag team because we, we're, we're, we kind of do that fairly well. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, that jumps into my mind is that some of the youth that I have met with who would be I would say most disenfranchised in terms of they are struggling, as you're saying, to get to school. Don't they're couch surfing, so they don't know where they're going to stay. They're not sure where their next meal is coming from. <coughs> if you layer in a mental health problem in there, it makes it all much more complicated to a be help seeking and b to even prioritize that. So I would say one of our huge barriers is that often our systems are structured in a very siloed way. Mm -hmm. And so when I have a general, like, how am I going to get through this next day problem, I have to pull from all different kinds of areas in order to try to solve that problem. And I would say then my mental health problem gets pushed really far down in the priority place. So the way we could create, in my mind, much more hub-like things where people can be receiving multi-services that are thinking about in a community kind of collective kind of way, how do I address all of those problems in a different kind of thinking and in much more of a one-stop shopping. 
Um, that's what I was saying earlier. We, because we think about 1D, kind of like this is a mental health problem and I go here for that, um, I think we're missing out on all the other pieces that are absolutely impacting on our, my, my mental health care. And then I think that my, my needs, basic human needs, are, are going to get prioritized over my mental wellness. And that those things kind of cycle back and forth and that makes it harder and harder. So I would say the complexity which many youth are facing um, can absolutely be a barrier. And when I think barriers, I think a system barrier, the social determinants of health, are hugely impactful, so I think of poverty. So mental health, poverty, housing, food exacerbate mental health. And so here's something radical, invest in social determinants of health, and then you might have a healthier population, right? So that's hugely concerning. And so when I think barriers and all the policies that go in to feed into that, mm -hmm. that is probably the biggest one that stands out for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. We have one online question, and then we'll take one. Uh, so this question is from Paige, uh, and it is, do you think education policy and curriculum has a part to play in youth mental health? Can we build mental health literacy and resilience tools into health classes, and what impact could that have? Mm -hmm. Great question. Mm -hmm. Who wants to leave that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to speak Sharon, to that? Comment on that one? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I think we all, all would say yes. So mm -hmm. I think the more we have conversations about mental wellness across the continuum, again, I would say, the better. Um, and I also think we have to be thoughtful about that. So um, as the parent of three boys at very different ages, I think what they can tolerate at different levels and understand well enough is also super important. So I think there has to be a high level of thoughtfulness about what information do they need and to build on some of the things that Sabina has said, how do we also think about well, mental wellness as being a foundational piece that we want to support um, kids in their development early on? So how do I learn to cope with distress? How do I, when I experience distress, how do I tolerate that and not immediately go to, oh my gosh, this is a crisis? Mm -hmm. So what around me can support me to be able to manage it? And how do I kind of tolerate little bits so that I can manage more and more and more? Um, I think they manage a lot right now, but I think our school systems could be supporting them from a curriculum kind of standpoint on, on that, the difference between distress that requires some kind of an intervention and distress that is part of life and that I have to experience sometime in order to foster growth. And when do I need additional help and when, when can I do that on my own? And I think our curriculum could do a different job of understanding that kind of continuum of, of what I can do to support myself. And I'd say there's been tremendous investments in, in Department of Education and the school system, which there needs to be. And um, so curriculum is one piece, but I think it's, it's investing in the capacity of the teachers so they can better support kids on the ground in the moment and building up their ability and, and uh, capacity to respond to those kids that might be unintentionally falling through the cracks earlier on. I think that's another piece of that education uh, role as well. I'd love to see curriculum um, expand and change to support all kinds of learners rather than the sit in the chair learners. Mm -hmm. I think we lose a lot of kids who are creative, creative and who learn by doing or who are uh, embodied learners. So I think that the system is a little flawed. It's a little outdated in, in a lot of ways. I'd like to shake it up so that mental health is, is, and wellness is actually just the vitality of someone being acknowledged rather than having to fit into a structure that, 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 that doesn't suit them. Also, I mean, just look at the university here. So many of my students are up to their ears in debt to be here. They work two jobs, like that's no small thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, but, but you know, the, my nephew who came to visit is 17 and already he's being asked what university, I mean, it's just like it's the grind on a very young brain. Mm -hmm. I think that's no small thing. And as I hear themes across this, we really are talking about these intersections of different sectors that we sometimes treat as separately. And mm -hmm. I think I wonder in policy if we treat them as separately, often education's over here and health's over here and really looking for opportunities where those can connect. In that way, I think some of the themes that you're hearing. I have, yes. My name is Barbie Burkhardt. I worked for 30 years in capital health in sterile processing over at both sites. When our head of the hospital felt that our department was not working efficiently, they had an outside department come in from another province and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to figure out how they were going to change it. 
three years ago, my 12-year-old daughter went into the mental health system. She went through the crisis team, the mobile crisis team. They've been to our house more than I can tell you. We went through all the school programs. I went to all the parenting classes that was required of me. I called 911 more than I could count on my fingers and toes. While waiting to go into the mental health system, she also had to go through the restorative justice. All you people that are, are, are here to really want to help the youth, including the panel, including my friend who lost her son as well, we all have it in us to help. The policy, the policies that were put in place is what? ended up breaking the system down enough that my daughter lost her battle when she was 15 years old. I'm so sorry. In the meantime, I went to go get help. Through my employee assistance program, and the person helping me said to me, It works in other provinces. He has worked in Yugoslavia, in the United States. He said, we need to have outside help because even though we all individually want to help, it hasn't been working. And we need, we're looking at it through these glasses with the government policies that are in place. We need somebody from the outside to come in and improve it because my daughter saw the book smart people. They're helping, they're just book smart mommy, right? One person, one person helped her because she connected with that person. And that was a person through the restorative justice who ended up moving to Belize and is no there long to help her. But then I, my son got in trouble and I had to go through the legal program and I ran across a mental health lawyer and she said, Barbie, I want you to go to the paper. I want you to go with your story because when you tell your story, people are going to listen and things are going to change. And I didn't go to the paper yet because I said to her, all the mothers before me have, who've lost their children have gone to the paper and it has not changed anything. When and how many is it going to take to change. Like, I know everyone's heart's in the right place, but I mean, when I have a police officer saying to me, I don't want to go on too long, but when I have a police officer saying to me, uh, she needs to stop playing this game. When I take my daughter to the hospital and they tell me, we can't keep her, and you need to take, and I refuse to take her home, and they said if I refuse to take her home, that they would put her in a shelter, that I would be considering abandoning no her, and I would have to give up my rights to my daughter. And I was not there to have that answer. I was there to get her help. And I know I'm rambling, and I'm sorry, but I need you to see the face of a mother who lost her child to suicide from a mental health system who's failing her kids, and it's happening more and more and more. I have so many mothers calling me and asking me, where do I go for help? What do I do? And I don't have the answers to give them. Then we have people coming to me and my friend Bobby, who lost her 40-year-old son, coming to us, looking to us for help, for where do they go for help? And, and there isn't any. Her and I, just two mothers who lost their child, are wanting to start our own support group through our hearts because we're so broken. We see all these other broken people and we don't, we know the system's failing. This one person helped my daughter because of the love in her heart, not because of what she learned in the book and not being held back by policy, but it, it needs to change. The one her doctor that she finally got to go to, she smoked weed that day and he refused to treat her anymore after that. That policy needs to change. Mm -hmm.
I so appreciate your and and I think and I'm in, sorry I know this was no, not a form it was supposed no. to be about questions but I need it's people in, to see mm -hmm. what it does and mm -hmm. it's important mm -hmm. as a as a community that we honor this and and we recognize this and I do want to say and I appreciate Sue saying this I earlier want, I want to know if an outside company can come in and change things because I wanted to go to the paper but is that really going to change anything mm -hmm. What I hear is a, is a plea and a conversation, and I look at all of you in this room and I look at all of us in this room who all have the best of intentions and are trying hard to look at how we start to look at creative solutions to, to meet these, these needs in that way and how we start to be able to open these lines of communication so that you're supported in the place where you are as well and how we start to build together as a community to start to support where we are with this. And I think we are making a lot of moves forward. And I think I absolutely acknowledge that there's a lot of work still to do. And there's a lot of, there's humans in this room. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that I want to pull forward. And, and, and I'm cognizant of this. And I'm seeing emotion in the room. And, and I think that that's actually a really important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we were talking about mental health without importance in the room, then we wouldn't be doing it a service. So I want to just pause for a second and notice that because this is what we're talking about. We're I, I have quite a story with, with suicide and I'm not, I'm not going to really go into any other than to say that I lost my father to suicide. He took his life when my mother was carrying me. Mm -hmm. So suicide has really affected my life mm -hmm. from my beginning. And, um, that there was a lot of shame attached to that. So I didn't even know that until I was in mm -hmm. my 30s that my father had taken his life. But then my brother took his life. Mm -hmm. And he was 48. And it affected me so bad that I have PTSD mm -hmm. because of that. And uh, then my son took his life. Mm -hmm. And now I have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, honestly, I just, I don't know, but um, I do see change. I, I personally do see, I cried out for help. I called mental health when my son died, and I, two years after that, I really felt like I was just shattered. And I, I called mental health, and they came, a, a mobile team came, and I was so thankful for that. All I needed to do was talk. I just needed a voice. I needed to be heard. And I do see my grandchildren. Their mother is, is a, a, a counselor in the school system. And I do see big changes coming. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to say that, you know, over the course of my life, there's huge changes that have taken place. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel I have a lot to offer with <laughs> mental illness. and emotional illness, stress, mm -hmm. and what happens, and, and you know, how it unravels, you know, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, uh, my son died from stress um, over the years, and, and not getting, you know, we came from a very volatile marriage, and all of that, you know, mm -hmm. so many things uh, went to, to that, um, to him, he was not mentally mm -hmm. ill as in you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I can't even think of it right now. But you know what I'm you're doing. About. You're doing a beautiful mm -hmm. job. Well, and I just I, want to. Say, I, I want to say I do see big changes, mm -hmm. and I'm very mm -hmm. thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And I do see my grandchildren getting the help that they need um, uh, uh, in the school and outside of the school. Mm -hmm. And and my grandson, he had a little bit of an anger problem. Really. And I said, you know, what's wrong? He said, well, I have problems, but I don't want to talk to you about it. Me? I said, okay, well, you need to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will. And he has. He's mm -hmm. nine. And he's changed his ways through the, the, you know, the help that he's getting mm -hmm. from the IWK. So anyway, I just I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think what we hear in this voice, I, I want to pick up on a comment that Sue made earlier, which is that there's a lot of collective wisdom in this room. Mm -hmm. And we learn wisdom in different ways. Sometimes we learn wisdom through 
experiences and tragedy in school and lots of different places. And I think what I hear is a coming together in this room to say we honor the experiences that have happened. And I think as we look to you, and as Sue has made this call earlier, as we look to you as the future students who have opportunities to write policy and to think about what, what that structure can do to either help or hinder some of these experiences, I think is a huge moment. So I want to say that everything that was shared in this room from all of you is valued and has contributed to the learning in this room. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have people online and we're contributing to that as well. And I think that as we start to have these broader discussions in a compassionate, curious way and figure out ways to move forward, I think it's a really, really valuable thing that we can do. And I think if I hear nothing in this, if I hear nothing else in this room, I hear passion from everyone. And it's a matter of how do we harness that to make things better so that we can move forward in that direction. So on that note, I think we're just about close to wrapping up. I want to thank you all so much for this. I think, you know, at the beginning, and I want to thank our panelists first off, and most of all, I want to thank our audience. You know, when we started this panel, I read the kind of dry intro, right? And the dry intro says, talking about mental health is a hard thing. And we might bring up emotions in the room. And at the beginning of the panel, it was very easy to go, yeah, 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 whatever, we're gonna talk about policy. This, to me, shows exactly why we talk about that. And I think the more comfortable we can get talking about messy things together and learning from each other about messy things, the better policy is gonna get and the better we're gonna get as people and as communities. So I would encourage you to keep talking about this and keep this conversation going as we go forward. Thank you.